Mr. Mark Selby, how are we, sir? Very good, Mr. Matthew Gordon. I hope you are enjoying your summer. I am. All two days of it. It's been brilliant. <laughs> Um, yeah, all, all, all good here, Mike. Um, it's it's kind of it's interesting. It kind of feels like there's um, there's a little bit of movement on a few fronts. Um, not least, nickel. We've been talking a little bit about the kind of geopolitics of Indonesia, Philippines, China, and you know, is is will the world's dem demand be sated by it or not, and uh, what the West is going to do about it? So, I'm going to. What if, why don't we start off with the nickel price? Because I want to talk about Indonesia. That's, I think that's the big kind of story that we need to talk about today. Yeah. So, um, again, nickel trading sort of sideways in its range. Uh, again, had thought we were going to break 20000 but it's hanging in pretty nicely around the $20,500, $21,000 uh, ton range. That's, uh, you know, uh, $9.50 a pound for those of you who are non-metric. Um, you know, we, we saw a bump up in LME inventories a few weeks ago, which gave the bears a little momentum. And we did see a push down towards 20,000. But again, we've seen inventories continue to slide uh, down again. And, and you know, the discounts in, in China, you know, uh, despite all the up and down in the prices are, you know, holding in at a certain level. So, again, the compression that we've talked about is continuing to hold in. You know, the other big news on that front is is there's uh, in the, the first Nickel Refinery in Indonesia is going to start commissioning uh, later this year uh, to joint venture with Qingshan and one of the other uh, Chinese companies. So again, you know, the, the, that capacity coming along is just going to help that compression, you know, take another big, big step forward. But uh, Indonesia has been very busy on other fronts. It, it has. And we're going to talk about it now. Let, in fact, let's talk about it now because um, we, we're talking about the the potential for a nickel cartel. And, you know, cartels are generally constructed for uh, the purpose of maintaining price at a very high level and restricting competition. So, Tell us the news first, and then we, let's talk about the implications. Yeah, so um, some nickel analyst five or six years ago um, had pointed uh, this out, given the huge growth that was coming down the pipe um, in Indonesia. Um, and so, you know, it, for me, it was always very obvious that a, a no, the potential for an ONEC was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, if you looked even a few years ago at how much supply Indonesia controlled, um, and if you tossed in the Philippines, New Caledonia, or Russia, any 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 couple of countries that had a no issues intervening in their mining sector, b uh, short of cash, uh, the temptation for a government, you know, to be able to extract additional revenues from that is just you know far too great. And so, uh, no surprise, um, you know, we're seeing Indonesia. Um, so there's the investment minister was actually quoted. Generally, you know, I they would. Tend to keep these discussions quiet, but they're making it pretty pretty clearly clear what they're up to. So they said, "Yeah, we're having some great discussions. We've, we're in discussions with three intense talks, which was what the story in the Jakarta Globe was." Um, and there's th you know three countries. Uh, they didn't name which other ones that are there, but I'm pretty sure they're you know two or three of that list um, that I just mentioned. Um, you know are are very keen. They're talking about keeping prices stable. Um, but uh, again, you know, I think stable, but <laughs> but moving up and, and allowing Indonesia to capture more of the revenue from their resource, you know, that's being utilized uh, today. So uh, and, and again, just in terms of metrics, uh, you know, you're looking uh, just the three Indonesia on its own controls almost almost as much as global nickel supply today as the entire OPEC cartel did at its peak in the early 1970s. So if you think, oh, there's no way it can do it, well, yeah, it can. I mean, they, they do really have, you know, the, the, the throttle in terms of global nickel supply. So it'll be really interesting to see how that evolves uh, over the next few years. Right. So uh, OPEC, I just want to explain for somebody, OPEC is obviously uh, the Organization for Petroleum and Exporting Countries, and that's oil and gas. Um, ONEC, I think you mentioned the word or the, the 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 word earlier, which is presumably organization for of of nickel exporting countries, right? So, what will the implications of this be? Because there's there's a whole bunch of stuff here in the in the background. We've talked about multiple multiple times over, over the past you know couple of years, where I've already used the word cartel. It kind of feels illegal in terms of price price control, um, but in the back and that's also in the backdrop of there's already um, nickel ore from Indonesia sent illegally to China. Um, so it's a very uh, interesting space, shall, shall we say. So, I mean, first of all, let me tell us a little bit more about, you know, why, why is it deemed illegal, um, you know, illegal to send, um, China nickel ore from, um, 
from Indonesia? Yeah, so so Indonesia placed a ban on ore exports, you know, which was a brilliant move from a developing country industrially. Um, you know, that's you know w- when you ship ore out of the country, you're basically capturing ten to fifteen percent of the value by having you know the next phase of processing nickel pig iron or you know uh, MHP H pal processing, um, and then going all the way down to stainless steel, and they're now wanting to go down to, to making you know precursors for batteries in Indonesia. You go from having ten percent of the value add capture to having ninety percent of the value add capture, and you know th- those things are really having an overall massive impact on the Indonesian economy. Indonesia was one of those countries that had a chronic current account deficit. You know, it looked like, you know, macroeconomically was going to really struggle to ever get a way out of it. Well, there, you know, the investment and the, 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 the huge increase in the value of exports because they're exporting stainless steel as opposed to raw ore has basically turned them. They have a trade surplus. They have a current account surplus. Um, and it's, you know, and they're one of the highest growth economies in the world today, and they're you know almost four hundred million, three, three to four hundred million people. So you know it's it's been a, been a big success story. The reason you know in, from their perspective, in terms of you know you know what's the cartel trying to achieve? So one uh, again, you know, just like we see with with OPEC today, you know they try and keep prices within a certain range. If prices go too too high, they increase production. If prices start to drop, they announced. Um, you know, they announced that they're going to cut cut back uh, production to, to manage supply. So we'll see whether, you know, they, they talk about price stability. So we'll see sort of, you know, how, how they're able to, to manage that going forward. Uh, that, you know, the second part of it is, again, you want to, okay, stable but higher, just increase the, you know, the total amount of revenue that's being generated, you know, because the reality is, is, you know, particularly with laterites, you know, when you have a hard rock deposit, it, you know, it potentially can go down for kilometers. Um, so the resource, you know, uh, you kind of have to draw a cutoff line where you can actually economically extract the resource. With laterites, you basically have X, the first X meters of the surface is, is a soil that's been uh, had, had, has been converted from rock um, and has upgraded uh, the nickel content of that soil. Once you take away that soil, it's gone. So it is a real finite resource that's there. And so, you know, it makes sense economically to try and, you know, maximize the the rent you're going to achieve as a country from that resource that's sitting on the ground. And then thirdly, you know, again, you've got, you know, the Indonesian miners, the Indonesian economy, you've got Chinese companies that have provided the bulk of the investment that's coming in, you know, who gets what share of the pie. So again, once you start to set up cartel-like structures, you know, you're able to then move different dials to, to allow more or less of the value that's being captured, um, but, you know, in Indonesia versus China. So uh, again, I, I expect you'll see movements on all three fronts. And, and uh, again, given how, how, you know, how publicly they're talking about it would not be surprised to see something announced, you know, in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. What fascinates me about all of this is, you know, how do, how do companies like yours benefit, you know, Canada Nickel Corp um, in Canada uh, and, and others in the West? How do you benefit from a situation like this? Or, or do you? Because, again, we're talking about, um, you know, a, a situation where, you know, OPEC has been the bane of North American oil markets and pricing. Um, they haven't always, you know, done what they've said or have done what they, what, what, what the West has hoped. Um, they're in control. It's, it's their, their cartel. The U.S. has tried, you know, with oil sands and, um, you know, the, the gas, et cetera, to kind of, I, I guess, take back control of this, of this kind of globalized, globalization, um, com- conversation and, you know, be in control of their own energy needs and, and, and requirements and output. Are there lessons there from OPEC which will kind of inform the way that the West reacts to ONEC, do you think? Oh, I guess twofold. So one, um, you know, because we've had a, this slide in our deck uh, off and on over the last uh, few years. Um, very simply, you know, were, were, were oil investments outside of OPEC really good multi-decade investments in the early 1970s? No. A thousand percent yes. Um and so, again, for investors out there, uh, you know, if, if you, you know, believe that this cartel is likely to get formed, then you should look at non-ONEC investments like Canada, like Australia, um, you know, who are going to benefit um, from, from the existence of this cartel. Um, the, 
And the second piece here is, uh, again, it'll just help underscore, you know, what the U.S. government is doing in terms of, you know, Inflation Reduction Act to try and uh, build, you know, diverse sources of supply. Uh, so, so again, you know, this is going to be super helpful for companies like ours with projects in Canada that can attract, you know, basically direct government funding. As we saw with oil back in the 70s and 80s, you saw all kinds of government money being thrown at the oil and gas industry to try and diversify supply away from OPEC. Uh, again, I, you, we've already seen it. Um, and I think it'll just just help reinforce um, that they're going to need to de de to uh, develop alternatives for, for certain critical minerals. So for us, you know, the, this, these kind of stories are an absolute home run for a anyone else um, who's got nickel projects outside those countries. OK, in in interesting. I think I think that's what investors are, in, in, you know, would want to know, need to know um, in, in terms of how they behave, how they buy and, you know, and, and I guess when they buy as well. Um, nickel, nickel price ed edging up. Um, talks of cartels and many, many stocks undervalued at the moment. It seems like prime time for me, but there we go. Look, that, that's a nice conversation. And we'll see what the feedback is. And maybe we kind of come, come back to that because the implications are huge. Um, should we bounce over to Australia? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, some very good news for a company called Ardia Resources on, on two fronts. Um, one, uh, they signed a non binding MOU with a couple of Japanese companies, including Sumitomo Metal Mining. Um, to look at uh, advancing their Kalgoorlie nickel project to a feasibility study. Uh, this is a, you know, basic, makes a huge amount of sense. Sumitomo Metal Mining is, is the only company that's had real success with H building an HPAL uh, outside of Indonesia. And so, you know, they, they would be a real logical partner uh, for the company. You know, Sumitomo Metal Mining really doesn't have any other projects in the Philippines um, that they, they could advance. Um, they kind of got shut out of Indonesia because Vale has changed their partnership from Sumitomo Metal Mining over to working with YU and some of the the, uh, the Chinese companies. So, you know, I think this is a nice fit from both both companies. Um, they put out a updated uh, uh, they put out a pre feasibility study uh, on the project. So uh, the, the the key thing here is. Um, and I think it's important to talk about if you look at sort of the you know global nickel reserves, the U.S. Geological Survey puts out a list of, 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 of global resources and reserves. And Australia is always this great big chunk of, of nickel resource and reserve. Well, a, a huge portion of it is these these nickel laterites that you see in Australia. Um, so they're slightly well, they're, 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 they're different than what you see in um, in uh, and then what you see in um in Indonesia and the Philippines, the tropical laterites um, on a couple of fronts. One is in, in, in Indonesia, you've got multiple layers of limonite and saprolite. In this one, you have sort of an overall more clay-like layer. It's a little more chemically uh, challenging uh, to process, and it tends to be lower grade, closer to kind of, you know, their, resort, their reserve was 0.7 nickel and 0.045 uh, cobalt. Um, Whereas the tropical laterites for the limonite fraction can be anywhere from one to you know one point three percent, and you obviously have the much higher grade saprolite, one point five to two percent, um, sitting underneath it. So, um, but again, in terms of sizable um, you know chunks of, of nickel resource uh, that are out there, you know these laterites um, uh, you know, are are really a big portion of you know potential supply outside of Indonesia. Uh, the challenge was is we saw a flurry of those back in that were developed in the nineteen nineties. So. Andrew Forrest, before he uh, had uh, became a, a multi-billionaire with Fortescue, um, had a company called Anaconda Minerals uh, that was developing the Murren Murren project um, that went bankrupt twice, um, struggled along. Glencore finally took it out of bankruptcy um, and has turned it into a, you know, a, a successful operation at that point. Um, there was two other operations, one called Bulong and one that called Cause, that were like 10 to 12,000 tons of nickel per annum. Both of those hit the wall, went bankrupt, you know, and have, and have, and have yet to reopen. So, uh, you know, the ladder rights are always a little bit challenging uh, to manage and operate. But, um, you know, these these are big, you know, this total resource is over 6 million tons. Um, they came out with a with a, a pre-feasibility study, CapEx 3 billion Australian to make an intermediate product. You know, that seems like a, you know, some of the projects out there have some pretty crazy uh, and I think undercapitalized uh, numbers. You know, this seems like a fairly reasonable uh, capital cost estimate. I haven't gone to it into detail, but at least it's in the right zip code uh, in terms of what's there. Um, their big, big NPV, of, you know, of 5 billion Oz at a 7% discount rate um, and, a, you know, IRR of 23% with a cash cost after byproduct credits, you know, of about $5,800 a ton. 
uh, you know, to produce nickel um, in MHP going forward. Um, you know, uh, one thing that was uh, is great. I mean, we won't be using nickel prices this high in our feasibility study, but they've got a twenty-five thousand dollar ton nickel price and a sixty thousand dollar cobalt price. Uh, I think one thing with all of the the leach projects that you see out there. Um, the you know cobalt forecast cobalt is a very big portion of of, of the revenues um, that are there and so um, you know so these projects economics are very sensitive to what happens to cobalt price and, and and we've seen you know what's happened with cobalt price you know over the last 12 to 18 months um, and so the, the big challenge for cobalt is going to be is that um, all of this HPL capacity that's coming on in Indonesia um, the, the ratio of nickel to cobalt is roughly, you know, one to 10. When you look at um, global supply in terms of cobalt to nickel, it's one to 20. So in terms of those projects having an impact on the market, it's going to hit the cobalt market well in advance of, of when it hits, um, when it hits the nickel market. So, you know, that's, I would say, you know, do your work, come up with a view on cobalt. You have to have a view on cobalt as much as you have a, a view on nickel uh, on those projects. But again, good to see this project advancing. Good to see some senior partners, you know, come into the space. Uh, but again, just, just to remind people, you know, th this is one of the biggest resources, lateral resources in Australia that's undeveloped. Um, and their first phase of production is only going to be 30,000 tons of nickel. So, yes, you know, we definitely need it. Um, you know, but, you know, we could use, you know, five or six of these projects to help create some supply um, outside of, of Indonesia globally. So, um, it, you know, we'll uh, stay tuned on, on, on this front. Right. Well, you know, as your um, chart says, you know, the, the nickel supply is not slow growth. It's, it's, it's shrinking. So we need all of the above. You've said it for years. We need all of the above. Um, uh, and, ho and hopefully this project, um, we hear more about this project as it, as it advances. Um, we should talk about, well, actually, I'll tell you what, a little bit of valet. You, you, you can't have enough valet conversation, can we? No, so, exactly. Have you got a little bit of news for me? Yeah, so um, very good to see um, that someone I had the very good fortune of working alongside with for three or four years, uh, back when we were both at INCO, uh, Mark Kudafani who recently retired from Anglo-American, uh, has taken over as chair of the board of Valet Base Metals. Um, and, uh, you know, he's going to, he started um, uh, just last week. Uh, so it, great to see him back on the scene, you know, from a Canadian perspective, as a Canadian, uh, I'm very happy uh, to see him back. Um, you know, he, uh, uh, working alongside him uh, back at that time, you know, we, uh, had some very big growth plans for Inco, and then we we don't we worked uh, as part of the team that tried to merge Inco and Falconbridge uh, together, you know, which unfortunately you know did not come to pass because there's a massive amount of synergies in the Sudbury Basin, and you know um, Valley with those assets, you know, we've seen production decline anywhere from fifty to seventy five percent between Sudbury, Manitoba, and Boise's Bay. So you know we've seen a, a massive decline in Canadian nickel production during that time frame. You know, Mark. Um, Mark is 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 a big believer in good good you know growth and good uh, you know in terms of good growth at good shareholder returns and so you know it'll be happy to see him um, you know come come back into the role you know the other piece in terms of ultramafic nickel deposits nice to see him back more on the nickel side of the world um, so in uh, earlier in his career he was at Western Mining. Uh, the, the grandparent of all of these ultramafic deposits is a deposit called Mount Keith in Western Australia. Um, Mark developed that in the mid 1990s. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so to have him come back into space, you know, Valet's got some great uh, ultramafic deposits in the Thompson area. Um, so it, it'll be be good to see, you know, what, what Mark does. You know, Mark, <laughs> Mark tends not to be a, a shrinking violet. And I think it'll be great to see him, you know, drive some real change at uh, that company going forward. Well, well exactly. It, you know, um, you know, what, what, I think he's, he's CEO at Anglo Ashanti, uh, sorry, Anglo Gold Ashanti after he left um, Sudbury and then CEO of uh, Anglo American. Um, he's not here for momentum play or just, you know, to, to kind of you know, shoot, shoot the breeze. Um, he is here to kind of do something big. I, I'm intrigued by the, 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 the newly formed entity within Valley called the Energy Transition Metals Board. Yeah. Big companies tend to be forward looking and when they make a decision, it, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of thought gone into it. Uh, a lot of restructuring goes into it and they're kind of working towards, you know, and, and the kind of end game. It's, it's not like junior mining in the sense of we'll change our name from 
whatever, black swan gold, black swan lithium. Um, it, these, these aren't knee jerk reactions. So, w what exactly do you think Valley is signaling with that, and what's its like end game? So, the, the big challenge with Valley was, you know, with the iron ore business and some of the issues they, they had with, you know, that, that business as a whole traded at a relatively low multiple. You know, and then within that, they had this very sizable base metal business, you know, so, you know, base metal, good base metal businesses can trade up to eight to 10 times EBITDA. And that stuck within a company that was basically at three to four times EBITDA. And so there's a massive amount of value to be gained by basically, you know, finding ways to create direct exposure for shareholders to the base metals business. Um, they had talked about spinning it off entirely and, and, and they, they, they didn't do that. They almost did that about seven years ago, but what they've done as a first step is create some outside shareholders into a separate entity, um, you know, called uh, Valley uh, base metals. And, and the idea there and the commitment there is, you know, that they really want to grow that business. So, and again, Mark, Mark wouldn't be showing up here just, you know, to, to, to keep, keep himself busy during retirement. You know, if, if, if he didn't have some commitments for them, I'm pretty sure that, you know, they're going to provide the capital and the, and the, and the bandwidth to be able to, to go off and actually build this business. Uh, and again, to Valley, it makes, you know, a huge amount of sense if they can, you know, it's tough to spin out a company that parts of it have been shrinking for 10 years. That's not a great, great growth story for investors. But if a Mark can kind of come in here, you know, over a five, seven year period, help really turn that story around and then look at spinning that out as a separate entity, um, you know, I think, you know, that strategy make, makes a lot of sense long term. Okay. But again, be interesting if you're going to follow what that one is like going to build out. Um, great for Canada to have him back. Great for Canada to have him back. Um, Right. Let, um, just just one, one final kind of story that might be worth a company that we've been talking about and following for quite a while, which is uh, Poseidon uh, Nickel. Um, what, what's happening there? Yeah. So we've been talking about their silver swan, black swan, and that's been, you know, quite quite rightly the focus for that company. One, you know, <laughs> you've got the silver swan high grade, which is which was, you know, one of the highest high nickel sulfide mines that have ever operated. And as well, they've got their black swan deposit, which is a, you know, lower grade disseminated deposit that's literally sitting next to a mill um, that that is sitting there uh, under, you know, unutilized. So uh, it made sense for them to get those both going and, and they have. And now that those are on their way, uh, they actually have uh, some former past producing mines called Maggie Hayes um, and Emily Ann. Those were part of the Lion Ore family back uh, 20 years ago that helped propel Lion Ore to its $5 billion uh, valuation. Um, so um, th these are these were mined out back in the in the late 2000s, but there's always a bunch of exploration potential around these things. So it's good they've now started doing the exploration work around some of the deposits. So what they call their Maggie Hayes West got some pretty interesting, you know, first rounds of drilling from there. Um, and again, we'll see how that goes. That's a nickel, copper, cobalt um, uh, deposit. So we'll see um, we'll see how that plays out. But again, good to see some other potential new deposits restarts. You know, come, come back uh, come back into view um, in that part of the world. Well, there we go. Nice little romp, romp through the world of, world of nickel as we do each week, um, see what's going on. General mood of the nation seems to be, from what I'm seeing from inbound, it seems to be getting slightly more positive. No matter what's been happening with the equities, um, the, the general level of inquiries, you know, certainly with us is, is, is rising. So what about you? Well, I think, I mean, the, there is there is a whole flurry of news around the, you know, uh, IEA put out their, you know, critical and first critical minerals report. And then we can maybe talk some some more about that and next week's show. Um, but again, I think the, the whole rhetoric around, you know, that, you know, we need more critical minerals. We need more critical minerals supplied from uh, countries other than China, I think is really starting to gain traction, you know, with investors. And so, you know, we're not quite there yet in terms of, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, market's coming back. But again, I think, you know, I think you are start, starting to see a bit of a mood shift. Some more generalists trying to, you know, sort of figure out how to get their dip their toes in the water into this space. And so, you know, hopefully as we move into later into to this coming year and, and into next, as you know, the recession uh, worries start to recede a little bit and we continue to see kind of strong growth from the EV sector, you know, that that'll help propel, propel interest across, you know, across the sector and see some real buying come into the market, which uh, we all need.